As we get our hearts set, you can stand with me. This is Psalm 142. I cry aloud with my voice to the Lord. I make supplication with my voice to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I declare my trouble before him. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, you knew my path. In the way where I walk, they had hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see, for there's no one who regards me. No escape for my soul. No one cares for my soul. I cried out to you, O Lord. I said, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Give heed to my cry, for I'm brought low. Deliver me, for they're too strong for me. Bring my soul out of prison, so I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me, for you deal bountifully with me. Bountifully with me. Yes, God, we just declare this morning that you are our refuge. You are our strength. You are our strength. Lord, we believe that you're enthroned yes. on our praises this morning. Would you just begin to praise him with me this morning? You're my refuge, Lord. You've dealt bountifully with me. And just those words to release my soul from prison. I believe he's doing that even today, even this morning. Releasing souls from prison where you felt stuck, where you felt trapped. His heart is for you to be set free. It's for his glory. Lord, it's all for your glory. It's all for your glory. We praise you. We honor you. We praise you. We honor you. We set your love on our hearts like a seal this morning. Yeah. 
your body, your blood is shed for me. And this is how I fight my battle. There is there's a table that you prepared for me in the presence of my enemy. It's your body.
but I'm surrounded by you. You may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. You may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Well, this is how I fight my battle. This is how I fight my battle. This is how I fight my battle. When I don't feel like dancing, I dance anyway. When I don't feel like singing, I sing anyway. Cause I know I'm fighting a battle. I know I'm fighting a war. So I'll sing, I'll praise anyway I'll dance anyway I'll shout anyway Even when I don't feel it Cause I know you're more faithful than my feelings I know you're more faithful than my wounds I know you're more faithful than my fears So I'll sing anyway I'll dance anyway I'll stomp my feet and clap my hands I'll shout, I'll lift a voice I'll lift unto God a voice of triumph, a shout of triumph. For it may look like I'm surrounded, but I know you wrapped me in your arms. I know you're an ever-present help in times of trouble. It may look like the enemy's coming and won, but three days later, three days later, you don't know what's going to happen. Three days later, he might roll you right out of the grave. He might roll you right out of the grave. He's coming now, He's coming now for your heart, He's coming now for your life, to give life and life abundant, 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 oh, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you, I'm praising anyway, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm me every time I can just jump right off the bed and you'll catch me Lord <laughs> I can just jump right off the roof and you'll catch me Lord give me the faith of a child give me the heart of a child give us the heart of a child because in your kingdom maturity is measured by dependence it's measured by 
a heart that's leaning on you at all times. I don't even want to walk without your hand. I don't even want to be independent from you. Give us the heart of a child. Give us the heart of a child.
For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Blessed is the one that has an ear to hear, and a heart to understand, and the will and the faith to be obedient. Amen. Do you feel yourself drawn near? I hear the Lord calling us near. And then even nearer still, nearer still, beloved. We sort of been accustomed to coming so far, but is there a are there, are there further steps to, to come near? Is there another place? Is there a, even another place closer, another place, another step beyond where you've been, where we've been? I hear him saying, come near. Ha, well, Lord, I thought this was near. I hear him saying, come near. He beckon us to come, Lord. He beckon us to step out of that which we know, that which we've experienced, the patterns that have become familiar to us into a place that is even unfamiliar. It's just near. You've not asked us to perform. You've asked us to draw near. Saturate our hearts in this place, Lord. Lift up the light of your countenance upon us in this place, Lord. Rise and scatter our enemies in this place, Lord. I see us standing under a, a great tree. A, like a fruit tree. And all the, the low-hanging fruit has been taken and there's a kind of a frustration that all the fruit is gone. All the fruit, I can see more fruit way up high, but I can't get there. Isn't that the way it is when we're, when we're first saved? It's like the fruit's just there. He's feeding us. He's nurturing us. He's giving to us. He supplies for us. But he tells us as mature saints to draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. To, for us to take those steps that are drawing near, that are rising up to a higher place. And is, what does it mean that he draws near to us other than that? which he has, he brings, other than that which we draw near to. And as we draw near, we're, we're, we're actually stepping up. We're coming to a higher place. And he's actually bringing uh, himself along with all the, the capacity that he has and the presence that surrounds him, the transforming glory that is him and, and deliverance and answers and healings and, and provisions. And, and deliverances that, that, are, that are just His, that are just His, as we draw near to Him and He draws near to us. Who can separate you? Father, I pray that you would wrap us in your presence. I pray in this moment, as we have simply drawn near, Father, in our hearts that perhaps to step beyond a place that we've already been and we've already harvested that fruit. God, there's a, a whole abundance here now around us. Answer prayers, new anointings, new callings, fresh revelation, insights, healings, provision 
your very heart. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. There be any need here this day, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for meeting the need, answering the call, answering the cry. Thank you for provision already made. Amen. Thank you for finished work. Father, I thank you for establishing our feet on the ground you've given us. In Jesus' name, for such a time as this. <clears throat> you know, I just believe the fruit's not just for us. It's, it's like a, 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 a storehouse, a harvest house. Going back onto the shelves and bringing it out. Bringing it out, taking it from where we found it and where we stored it and bringing it out and providing it. That's, that's his church in this day. Father, what, how could we, things that, that are so far beyond our capacity to do and of ourselves, you've already done. And so we thank you for establishing us in your finished work, opening our eyes to what you've called us to and what you've supplied for us. In Jesus' name, thank you, Father. Praise your name. Give him a good hand clap this morning, a shout of glory. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise God. So good. You guys look marvelous today. Maybe it's just that the lights are in my eyes. I don't know. We missed an hour. We missed an hour of sleep last night, didn't we? You say, Pastor, what are those bags under your eyes? <laughs> well, I missed an hour of sleep last night. Come on. Praise God. Praise God. I'm going to ask the ushers to wait upon us for our morning tithes and offerings. I want to remind you that uh, today is Mission Sunday, and uh, we've got some great missionaries with us right here today. Uh, so we want to sow our missions offering. Any undesignated missions offering that you give is going to go to uh, the support of the Grishams and, and their ministry. And uh, so as you prepare that, of course, there's different ways for you to give. Uh, you can go on the church, the church website, tlcpueblo.com. There's a, a giving app that's on the website. And uh, maybe your church app, if you have that downloaded, you can use that, obviously. And, you know, cash works, checks, money orders, things like that. Where there's a will, there's a way. Is there a will? Amen. Amen. Praise God. I'm going to ask Larry if you would uh, bless the offering for us, please. Father Malachi said, test me, test me, give, and see if I don't give back, see if I don't give back to others. That's what I'm working today, Father. That's what we do. Bless us, Father, beyond the bounds of what we can do or not. Thank you for these offerings. Thank you for giving hearts, Father.
attention. We lift our eyes to you and we bless your name this morning. Have the inheritance day and night for my life, for my heart, for my city. Receive the glory that's due your name. We bless you. Amen. Good morning and welcome to the Life Church, a caring and Christ-centered church. If this is your first time joining us, please fill out a visitor's card located in the seat pocket right in front of you. Men of TLC, we want to let you know we're going to be having ourselves a work day coming up this Thursday, March 18th from 5 to 7.30 p.m. here at the church. And we're going to have food and drinks provided. So come on out and lend a hand and help us get the church in order. Also, be sure to join us for the Pueblo Incense House of Prayer every Monday, Tuesday, and Saturday at 6 p.m. here at the church. Ladies of TLC, be sure to join us for our women's Bible study. It's happening every Friday at 10 a.m. here at the church. If you have any questions or would like some more information, please see Angela Crank or Juanita Stone. Parents and youth of TLC, don't forget we've started our brand new youth ministry called Rooted. And we'll be meeting every Wednesday night at 6 p.m. at the youth room below the TLC offices. For more information, please see James or Michaela Harvey. And finally, here's a short video from our friends at Casa Hogar in Aguas Calientes, Mexico.
dice en inglés? Pásale. Our friends at Casa Hogar want to thank you for your support in getting them back into their facilities. Kids, you are now free to go to Sunday school. Now please join me in welcoming our special guest, Tim Grisham, as he comes to bring the word. Praise God. Hey, all the kids, uh, real quick, let me catch all the kids, 5 to 13. Anybody 5 to 13, can I... Get him up here just for a minute. This was totally unplanned. And I like that kind of stuff. Glory to God. You can just stay right down there. Come on up here. Get up here a little closer if you're comfortable with getting closer. You know, this morning... Uh, while we were singing, did you hear somebody speak out something, a word from the Lord? Did you hear that when somebody talked? And they used the word preeminence, which is making something first. And you know, in the Bible, it's, this is what Jesus said. Jesus said to seek. Have you ever played hide and seek before? Yeah. Anybody? Let me see your hands if you played hide and seek. Okay, so all of us have played hide and seek, right? So you hide something and you go look for it. And Jesus said, you seek or you look for his kingdom. Now, let me just real quick tell you that God's kingdom is all about how God does things. And the way God does things most of the time is totally different than what other people do. You understand that? You know, we have ways of doing things, but then God has better ways. God's ways are always better. So Jesus said we're to seek or we're to look for his kingdom and his righteousness. In other words, his way of doing things that are right. Okay? And I wanted to share with you guys real quick this morning that when I was five years old, I can remember this, right here in this town. I remember playing and I was, I was actually fishing with a little piece of string and a hook that my mom tied on the end of the string. And I was sitting there trying to fish in a irrigation ditch, which there's usually no fish in an irrigation ditch, okay? A ditch with water that is supposed to water the plants. There's usually not fish in those. But anyway, it kept my mom out of her hair, you know, kept me from bugging her. So I'm fishing, and I looked up, and I looked at the mountains, and I remember thinking, I wonder if God lives over in those mountains. I'm five years old. And the more I begin to think about where God lived, then I begin to think about, God, what do you want to do with my life? I'm five years old. Are you five? I was your age. And I thought, God, what do you want me to do 
for you. Well, when I was 13, so how many of you are 13? Okay. How many are close to 13? <laughs> okay. When I was 13 is when I made a decision to ask Jesus to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. So two important times in my life. Five, when I said, God, what do you want me to do for you? And I really felt like God said, I'm going to have you do something special. And I want you guys to know that every one of you are special, and God has a special plan for every one of your lives. But the key to finding what that special thing is, is to put him first. And let me just challenge you a little bit. Maybe some of you know more about sports. Maybe some of you know more about certain games on the internet. Maybe some of you know more about how to operate your cell phone than you know about God. So I want you to do this. I want you to ask your parents, teach me about God. Okay? Put a demand on your parents. So I want to know, teach me about God. Help me learn about God because it's only through learning about him that you'll really find out what his plan is for your life. Okay? So thank you for giving me a few minutes and you can go on to your class. Hallelujah. So I'm really blessed this morning to be here. Um, it's been two years. We missed, uh, you know, the great year of 2020. For a lot of people, I call it the year of crackdown. All right. Uh, and I'll, I just won't say any more about that. Hallelujah. <laughs> But uh, anyway, it's, it's a blessing to be here. Thank you, Pastor Rich and Kathy, for uh, always being so willing to have us in. I don't know how many years it's been now. It's back in the late 80s and till now. Hallelujah. So I'm just uh, I'm blessed to be here, blessed to be a part of this ministry. And how many of you, I mean, many of you are familiar uh, faces today. And by the way, Congratulations, you had two opportunities today to not show up. I mean, two, at least two excuses. It could have been the snow or the fact that we sprang forward. And uh, I have no excuse today to preach till 1 o'clock because I see the time. Is that the correct time, gentlemen? Uh, one time I was preaching here on uh, the spring forward Sunday and the clock in the back that hadn't changed. And so I preached right up to noon, but people were getting pretty antsy about it. And uh, it was because it wasn't noon, it was one o'clock. And so I won't be doing that to you today. I want to, real quick, just if all of my family members would stand up, I'm not going to introduce them individually, but uh, family members, would you please stand? So I have daughter, two of my daughters here, a niece, sister-in-law. So yeah. Um, my youngest daughter and her husband and three grand or two <laughs> I get numbers two grandkids uh, are here came in from Ohio and then uh, my middle daughter and her husband and three grandchildren came in from Romania so they're the the real missionaries and uh, and my sister-in-law came here from all the way on the other side of the Arkansas River and uh, <laughs> hallelujah uh, glory, and who am I? And Melissa. Uh, by the way, let me, uh, Peggy. Have me. Uh, let me do a quick commercial here. Uh, I've got a book that came out this time last year, my first book, and I'm just so grateful to my niece, uh, Melissa, that's back there, who uh, just waded through the mess that I had in writing this book because my grammar and everything else. Now, I've since uh, come into the revelation of Grammarly, which is a computer uh, app or program which helps those that are trying to help me. It makes their job much easier. But uh, thank you again, Melissa, for all the work that you put into this and uh, making it make sense. But anyway, 
Uh, this is a book that our, I said it to everybody last night that was here in our evangelism training, um, that this is a book of a lot of stories about my, my life here in Pueblo, the city of Pueblo, a lot of what I wrote about, about in this first edition, and I'm going to write several more, is just stories of my encounters with people here, many of them again in Pueblo, sharing Jesus with them and how God intervenes supernaturally. Amen? And uh, so there's, I'll just read a few titles here. By the way, good to see the Beechams. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Um, there's, uh, here's one, How to Get Johnny Saved. Now, that was actually something that happened in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, track or Treat. Some of you may even remember. I don't know if we ever did that uh, with you guys or not. I did it here in Pueblo. Um, there is uh, Meet Me for Drinks. How about uh, Tracks and Toilets? That's a good one, Tracks and Toilets. That happened right here down on... Uh, I get some of these streets mixed up today, but I think it was down on Grand. Anybody remember back in the 80s? I don't know if they even still do it to this day, but Budweiser uh, came in and they would block several blocks of the street and they would bring in bands and, and there would be just a big... Do you remember that? Uh, it, that happened here in Pueblo. It happened on several occasions. And so I had it in mind that somehow I was going to go down there and I would get on the main stage where the bands are. I would get a hold of the microphone and preach the gospel. Hallelujah. I, I always have great expectations. Amen. And uh, while that did not happen, by the way, I did not get the mic. They did not invite me up on the platform. Uh, God supernaturally opened a door of ministry, and uh, you'll just have to get the book and read about it. Amen? It was awesome. It was awesome. And I don't know, you may have been there, uh, Pastor Rich, but, or Elvin, or I know uh, Elvin uh, was out on the streets many times. We were out there together, a number of us. At one time here in Pueblo, uh, we would meet on Friday and Saturday nights, and there would be people representing seven different churches that would go out on, on the streets with me. And, uh, and we did this, I mean, weekend after weekend after weekend for, from uh, 1989 to uh, right up to 1994 uh, when, when I moved away. And then I know others continue to do that. So uh, praise God. Saw a lot of awesome things happen, and I believe it's time to see more things happen. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to pray and we're going to get into the word. Father, I thank you for this opportunity. Lord, I thank you for each and every person here today. Lord, the, those that are uh, viewing online, Father, we thank you for them. Lord, I declare today in the name of Jesus Christ that the word of God will penetrate our hearts. Lord, work in us and work through us your perfect will. God, that is our desire. Lord, not just to please you uh, in, in our own life, but please you in everything that we do. And we just give you praise and glory. Thank you, Holy Ghost, for speaking to us, for opening the eyes of our understanding. Lord, help us to see and understand and help us to receive in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Well, uh, you know, for several days, uh, I had been asking the Lord what to share. Uh, I wanted, I knew I had the opportunity last night, if you were here, it's sort of the highlight of ministry for me when I can uh, just stand here and share the Word of God concerning you as a witness. Amen? I shared with everybody last night, and I've said this many times if you've, um, you know, been around me very long, that every one of us are a witness. Do you know even unbelievers are witnesses? <laughs> they are. They're witnesses of whatever they have given their life to. They're a witness. They, they're, they give evidence to what's going on in their life. You get around unbelievers, you get around just the good old boys that don't know Jesus, or you get around the wicked and evil people. They, they all witness of what, they're witnesses of what's going on in their life. You can see it. I tell you today, it's becoming very clear. People aren't hiding behind any curtains. They're not hiding in, in the dark corners. I mean, people are exposing themselves and 
what they believe and what they have given their life to. They're a witness of that. And you and I are witnesses, the Bible says. That's why it's so important. You know, the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8, I like the New Living Testament. I think it reads this way, that you will be my witnesses with great effect. And I decided a lot of years ago that if I was going to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ, I did not want to be the wimpy, uh, you know, I remember one, one evangelist back when I was in Bible school, he always used the term Mamsy Pamsy Mickey Mouse Christian. I didn't want to be a Mamsy Pamsy wimpy Mickey Mouse Christian, Mickey Mouse excuse for a Christian when it come to being a witness to other people. You know, I look at it this way. The Bible says all those who desire to live godly in Christ will what? Suffer, suffer persecution. All those who desire to live godly. In other, all those, listen, every one of us that are going to live a Christ life are going to at some point in time You're not going to escape it. You're going to suffer persecution. You're going to suffer being ridiculed or made fun of or, you know, called uh, a fanatic or maybe even worse than that. We know people today that are, you know, by the thousands are losing their lives, especially in other countries and and, uh, for their faith. Okay? Uh, Am I bumming you all out? Are you? This is serious stuff, yeah. I want to, this morning, I just want to bring our attention to what God has his attention on. Amen? And first of all, I want to say that God has his eye on you. And that's what I heard the other day when I said, Lord, what, what do you want me to share on Sunday morning? He said, well, first of all, I want you to share with everybody that God has his eye on them. And that not only does God have his eye on you, but God has his eye on all of humanity. God has never turned his back on humanity. And he hasn't started now. And as as much as sometimes I want to turn my back on humanity, and I want to turn my back on some of the things that are going on in our culture, and I'd, I'd like to just go a different way. There's been temptations over the past year of thinking about, you know, I'd like to build a tiny house and move to the mountains of Colorado and Just go hide. (laughs) Sort of sounds nice, you know, fishing, live off the land, be a minimum list or however you say it. But Peggy won't let me do that, neither will Jesus. But, you know, there's that, that, that thought will pass through at times where you just, I don't know about you, but I get pretty tired of what I see going on. And yet, look at it from God's perspective. He sees everything. His eyes are on you and his eyes are on humanity. Let me read a few verses to you. Proverbs 15, 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place. Now get this, this is amazing. Beholding the evil and the good. So God doesn't hide his eyes from the evil that's going on. He's not like, you know, well, uh, that's not really happening. Over in Proverbs 5.21, this is the Good News Bible translation. The Lord sees everything you do. Wherever you go, he's watching. Sounds like the old Santa Claus song. (laughs) You better watch out. You better be good. You better not pout. You know, why? Because Santa's watching you, man. He's got a list. He's marking it down twice. I I don't remember all, uh, all of the deal. But it's really sort of a perverted Uh, You know, I used to think, well, that's how God is. I mean, it does say that he sees everything you do. Wherever you go, he's watching. You know, I know that I'm talking to mainly church people, but we are streaming. And so, you know, but I've known church people to do some things that if you really thought about it, I mean, if you really took a moment and thought about it, and you knew that God was watching not only what you do, but where you go, you'd probably think twice about doing whatever it was you were doing or going wherever it was you were going. I remember when I first started uh, as, a, as a Christian going into bars 
and witnessing to people, the thought in the back of my mind is, what if somebody sees my car parked in the parking lot of the bar or the nightclub? Or what if somebody that I know sees me in the bar? And then I thought, well, what do I have to be worried of? I'm, in, I'm not in there drinking and partying with the, the crowd, man. I'm in there talking to him about Jesus. Amen. I told people last night that I don't care what people think about me. And that's not, a, that's not, a, uh, that's not coming out of a, a broken heart or, you know, I've been hurt by so many people, I don't care anymore. No, I really do care. But I care more about what God thinks of me than what other people do. So God's opinion of me is more important to me than what other people's opinion is. So if their opinion and God's opinion are opposite, I'm going with God's opinion. Amen. If, if what I'm doing for God upsets you, so be it. Be upset. I, I can't control other people's emotions. I can't control. You know, I'm saying these things because we all have opportunity. You know, if you're on any kind of social media, I mean, there's so many opportunities to engage into, in my opinion, in a, a lot of worthless senseless nonsense and to try to defend yourself for what well you know I, I don't want i don't want them to be offended i don't want people to think bad of me i don't listen just you might as well pull up your pants and just bite the bullet and get it in your mind that not everybody's going to like you now i i have this attitude I have what I call a good news attitude. And a good news attitude is everybody likes me. And everybody wants to hear what I have to say. And that's just how I feel about it. Isn't that right, sister-in-law? I, I tell things to, I really give my sister-in-law a hard time. And she deserves probably some kind of trophy from God when she gets to heaven. I, I don't think she's going to get it, but, you know, that's just my opinion. And probably my opinion don't count, but anyway, she's a good sport. But I do, I have this opinion, not of myself, but Christ in me. I have this opinion that, you know, what's in me is irresistible. What's in me is what people need to know. What's in you, Christ in you, the Bible says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's what people need to know. And, and I want to help us this morning here. Understand something that if God has his eye on not only you, but on everybody, because the Bible says he beholds the evil and the good. Let me read Psalms 34, 15 says, The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. His ears are open to their cries for help. And then it says in 33, 18 of Psalms, But the Lord watches over those who fear him, those who rely on his unfailing love. Boy, don't you love that? And then 1 Peter 3.12 says, The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. His ears are open to their prayers. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. Doesn't mean that he doesn't see them. You know, but to behold his face is, listen, if you're doing evil, you're not going to stand in his favor. You're not going to stand in his goodness, Right? His goodness is extended to you if you're doing evil, but you're not going to experience it. Let me read out of Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15, the Good News Bible. It says, so be careful how you live. Don't live like ignorant people. Be like wise people. Make good use of every opportunity you have because these days are evil. Don't be fools but then try to find out, don't be fools, but try to find out what the Lord wants you to do. I'll just stop here for a minute and share uh, just a brief little situation that I was facing some months ago. Because of everything that uh, not only we, all of us here, but our nation, the world, has been going through, uh, concerning, and, and I don't even like 
saying the name, but you know what I'm talking about, everything we've all been going through with this pandemic stuff and with the elections and all the wickedness and all the evil that's manifesting. I don't know about you, but, you know, uh, it's seemingly very amazing to me what we're seeing happening right before I, I mean, to the point that I'm like, how are people getting away with what they're getting away with? How is it that certain things aren't being stopped? What's happening? And so long about April, I was experiencing a lot of frustration. And the more that I would watch television and watch news, and I try to watch news that's more in line with, you know, more in the middle than off to the left, I like to be right, amen? I like to be right. And you know, the Bible talks about those that are on his right hand are the ones that are blessed. Those on the left, you're up a crick. I'll just tell you that right now. You don't want to be on the left side. You want to be on the right side. And that's just what the Bible says, all right? So you apply it however you want to apply it. But I was just getting frustrated and getting angry and being even angry at Christians and angry at the church. Because in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, and it reflects nothing on, I have so many pastor friends, so if I make them mad, I'm, I'm only hurting myself, right? But I just have to tell you where I was at. I just felt like, man, we, why, why are we shutting our doors? Why, why aren't we doing this? Why aren't we? And so all this stuff is, is just starting to really bug me. So I hope this helps somebody this morning. And then I got this revelation. I thought, God, what are you thinking about? God, what do you think about all of this? What, you know, what's going on, God? And I really felt like God said, my eyes are on the same thing they've always been on, and that's mankind. My eyes are on humanity. I sent my son to seek and save those that were lost. I've called you, son, to be the light of the world, a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. Nothing, because, just because of what's going on around us, and I don't mean that we shouldn't do everything we can do in the natural and, and you know, put the right people in office and do, you know, there's a lot of things we can do. Ultimately, the problem doesn't lie in politics. The problem doesn't lie who stands in the White House, the problem lies with the fact that there's not enough people being born again, there's not enough people being reached with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because you can put something in law, you can enforce it, but that doesn't change people's hearts. You can make people do something or try to make them abide by something and thank God we have laws because... I mean, that's what the Ten Commandments was all about. The Ten Commandments wasn't to teach you how to live right. It was to prove to you you couldn't. The Ten Commandments was given to literally keep people from going so far off the edge that they just utterly destroyed themselves through sin. So God brought down these commandments to say, listen, thou shalt not do this or else. It's just like, you know, if they pass a law, which I suppose it could happen, who knows today, but if they passed a law that out here on I-25, we've just gotten, we've canceled the speed limit. Speed limit is now canceled. You do whatever you want to do. You drive as fast as you want to drive. All traffic rules have been erased. They're canceled. Well, guess what? Some of you are going to be smart enough to still keep your speed at a level where you can control yourself and your actions, right? Now, I'm probably going to drive a little faster, depending on what I'm driving, just because I can, because there's no law telling me I can't. So I might just run her on up there a ways. Come on. But if everybody has the same idea as me, let's just run her on up there. Let's just start rolling it out there. Let's just do what we want to do. What's going to happen eventually 
It's going to get so crazy. There's going to be all kinds of accidents. What's going to happen is we're going to start killing ourselves, mutilating ourselves, crashing our cars. You know, it, it's going to be chaos. So we have laws to try to hold down the unruliness, right? And that's really what God did with the Ten Commandments is just to try to, why? Until the heart of a man is changed, you got to have laws and you got to have rules and you got to, you know. And so my point being this this morning, that you and I have a job to do. If we really want to change our city, if we really want to change our nation, if we want to change the world, there's just really one answer, and that's Jesus. Again, I'm not, I'm not saying don't do all the other things, but what should be most important to every one of us is what's most important to God, and that is humanity. So I had to make some adjustments back in April. I had to get my eyes off of what, you know, uh, my pastor friends are doing, what the church people are doing. I had to get my eyes off of those that have come back, that haven't come back, those that are staying home, not staying home, wearing a mask, not wearing a mask, what, what this is going on, what that. I just had to finally shut it all off and say, you know, the smartest person there is to listen to is God. The best direction you can get today is right here. And the Holy Ghost is the one that will lead and guide you, the Bible says, into all truth. You will not go wrong by doing what Jesus said, what I shared with the kids. You will not miss it. You will not go wrong. You will not wake up one day going, oh my God, how did I get here? If you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's not just a Bible story. That's not just something that Jesus said because it sounded spiritual. That is a truth that we're to live by. That truth that we're to live by is to focus on our attention on, God, how do you want me to walk in this life? How do you want me to live my life? How do you want me to live at work? How do you want me to live at home? How do you want me to live in my community? What kind of influence should I be having on other people? Should I just get upset like Brother Tim was getting ready? You know, I just, I'm, I'm thinking, man, there's certain people, groups, just let them go to hell. Seriously, you want to be that stupid and you want to believe that kind of idiocy, then just knock yourself out. I'm not going to mess with you. But that's not God's opinion. You know, every, every so many years of my life, I've noticed God's had to, you know, just sort of make an adjustment in me. And it's usually just because I get, I just get frustrated with certain things that I see get frustrated with certain people. Why are they thinking that way? Well, you know why people are doing such crazy stuff and why culture is going just weird and nuts and everything else? It's called deception, and Jesus said that people would be deceived. It's what the devil does to people. And I mean, it's, it's just, to me, it's mind-boggling. But that doesn't mean that the gospel, which Paul said is the power of God unto salvation, the gospel, though it seems foolish, the simplicity of the gospel, see, what good, what difference is it going to make if I talk to the person working behind the cash register at Walmart and I say, listen, let me ask you a question. Do you know Jesus? So, oh, brother, them people at Walmart, they'll spit on you, they'll laugh at you, they'll... You know, they'll have security come. They'll, so what? I've not experienced that myself. I mean, I've experienced people blow you off and, you know, just, yeah, whatever. I shared with folks last night, yesterday afternoon, Peggy and I went to get something to eat. We were at the Cracker Barrel. And uh, the guy, you know, I was paying my bill. His name was uh, Zebulun. That's an unusual name. And so I caught, caught, that caught my attention, and I said, Zebulun. And he said, yeah. I said, uh, is that a Bible name? He said, I think it is. I said, wow. I said, Zebulun, are you a Bible man? 
uh, well, sir, I don't really know what you, I mean, if you mean, am I, I I'm a Catholic and I'm a Christian, he threw it all in there, you know, I'm, and I, I believe you could be a Catholic and a Christian, okay, I'm not saying anything about that, but he said, I, I, I'm a Catholic and I, I'm, I'm Christian, I said, really? I said, well, that's not what I ask you. I ask you if you're a Bible man. Well, I don't know what you mean. I said, well, I'm a Bible man. That means I believe the Bible. I believe the Word of God. I believe what Jesus said, and I follow Jesus. He's my Lord and Savior. And if he comes back to get us, I'm going with him. And he said, well, yeah, my brother's been telling me that kind of stuff. And I said, well... Zebulun apparently, an assumption on my part, tell me if I'm wrong, but apparently, Zebulun, if your brother's telling you these things, it's because he has good reason to believe if Jesus comes back, you're not going. You're fixing to get left behind, Zebulun. So maybe you should listen to what your brother says. He said, well, I'll take that in consideration. I don't know that I persuaded him, but I really believe he probably went home. I believe he probably, before he went to sleep last night, thought, man, that guy was weird. (laughs) But then he starts thinking about, you know, my brother keeps telling me the same thing. Why would a complete stranger, some gray head, white headed, I'm not even gray no more, some white headed old guy, because he's probably in his 20s, just boldly declare about Jesus and not missing his coming because you know he is coming, right? You know, I don't know if I'm going to... I've just always counted on him coming in my lifetime, just sort of counted on it, but I really don't know, but it has nothing to do with whether he comes today or, or he never comes in my life. It has nothing to do with how I live for him. I'm not living for him in fear that I'm going to miss the coming. But there's a lot of people that are going to miss it. So let me wrap this up. I, I've, I've really, you know, had this adjustment now. I've got my attention on, back on where, where it needs to be. I don't care what all the crazy people are doing. I don't care what Washington's doing, you know, I'm going to do the things I know as a good citizen. Proverbs says, the good influence of godly citizens causes a city to prosper, but the moral decay of the wicked drive it downhill. So yes, I'm going to vote. I'm going to do everything that that as an American citizen I can do to change what we can change in the natural, but what I know for absolute sure The absolute answer, the absolute solution to the problem is the salvation. It's turning people from darkness to light, from sin to righteousness. That will change a nation. That will change your neighborhood. That will change your family. That will change the people you work around. Amen. And then this idea, which... I started meditating last year on hell. I thought, I don't ever think about hell. I'm saved. Why would I? Why should you and I think about hell when we're going to heaven? But I just got to thinking about hell. And the more I thought about hell, the more I thought about, I'm not going there, praise God. But there are some that are. And so I begin to go to the Word of God. I begin to read and study about what does the Bible say about hell. Proverbs 27.20 says, Hell and destruction are never full. That means there's always room for another one. Right? So the eyes of man are never satisfied. Hell's sort of like the, the, the fleshly desires of a person. No matter how many cars I buy over the I bought so many cars over the years, you know, and I buy them, fix them up. Oh, I like old cars, and I'll sell this, and then I'll think, boy, I'm going to hang on to this, and, you know, till Jesus comes. And then I see another, oh, well, I'm going to get rid of that and get this one, you know. And, and, and I'm just never, uh, you know, I could just let my flesh go and never be satisfied. I'm content 
But if you ask me, what, what do you really want today, Brother Tim? I could name off a few vehicles that I really want, but I still, I'm content with what I have. I'm not upset. I'm not depressed. I'm not focused on that stuff. But just like those natural desires, hell's never, there's always room for one more. And as I got to thinking about hell, I remembered a song back in 1977. So back then, even though I was born again, I was at a place in my life, I got saved when I was 13, but in 1977, I was, that was my year that I graduated high school, and so I'm, what, 18 or something, uh, 1977, the Eagles had this song, Hotel California. So even though I'm, I'm a Christian, I, but I'm, man, I'm listening to, you know, the Eagles, I'm listening to Pink Floyd, I'm listening to... Uh, just all kinds of stuff, you know. And I remembered this song, and some of the lyrics just, as I was thinking about hell, I'm going to read these lyrics to you. And you. A lot of you already know where I'm going. Listen to this. We are all just prisoners here of our own device. You know, one day, well, I don't have to say one day, every day, Every hour of every day, possibly every minute of every day, more than likely every second of every minute of every hour of every day, of every week, of every month, of every year, somebody is entering hell. All the time. People are entering into an eternity. And I just started thinking about what? We don't, none of us really comprehend what forever is. How can we comprehend what eternity is, Pastor Rich, when, you know, I should be wrapping this up any minute where we've got, you know, time frames for everything. We go by a calendar where everything's planned, and, and yet we're talking about living for eternity. And if you know Jesus Christ, if you've accepted him, then you're going to live a life eternal. But if you don't, come to Jesus Christ, receiving him as the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. Then you will continue to live eternally, but in eternal death, separation, hell. You ought to read what the Bible says about hell sometime, but let me finish these lyrics. We're just prisoners here of our own device. No one will wake up in that moment from death to eternity, they won't realize uh, in their mind, wow, this is somebody else's fault. They'll have the revelation, I'm here by my own decision. No one will blame God for sending them to hell because they'll realize how many times they had the opportunity to turn to him but chose to do it at another time or, yeah, one of these days. I've heard a lot of, a lot of this. One, one of the, when I get older, when I do this, when I do that, well, you know, then I'll, I'll get religious. Well, I'm not talking about getting religious. I'm talking about getting right with God. And in the master's chambers, they gathered for the feast. <laughs> this is gross. They stabbed it with their steely knives, but they just can't kill the beast. The last thing I remember, I was running for the door. I had to find the passage back to the place I was before. Reminds me of the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Who the rich man, separated by a great gulf, this was pre-resurrection, you had the rich man who you know, just looked at the beggar and never, you know, just didn't give God any time or any attention and ended up in this side of the great gulf in, in Hades and hell. And over here you have the beggar who ended up in paradise. And the rich man has the audacity to call on the beggar to just, just dip your finger in the water to cool my tongue. Boy, if you just think about what hell, it's hard to even, listen, hell is not a hundred years. 
Hell is not in a thousand years. God's going to finally say, listen, those people have suffered enough. Just turn off the fire. <laughs> Let's just go ahead and bring them out of hell. They've had enough. There's just never no end. If you're sitting here this morning thinking, well, but how could a loving God, you know, do that to people? You have to realize God does not, he's done everything opposite of that. God has done everything. The Bible says he's given his only begotten son. He sacrificed the greatest sacrifice of all, that whosoever. He doesn't put any limitations on, well, you know, if you're white, if you're black, if you're brown, if you live here, if you live there, if you're of this stature or that. No, there's no limits on any of it. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not hope so, maybe so. He's done everything. He, in fact, he's made the way of salvation so easy, he just said, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it just, there's just one way. You know, there's a number of different ways. I've got family here today that they could have come and I could have drove here. A number of different ways from on the other side of town to get to this church. Could have come up 4th Street or I could have, you know, went out the boulevard and up 50 and around. And just a number of different ways depending on where you live. But, you know, uh, I told a friend last night that come from Colorado Springs, I started telling him, well, take the 4th Street exit. And then, and then I said, wait, wait a minute. No, just put it in your GPS. You'll find out, just stay on 50. It's real quick and easy that way. And that's really the plan of salvation. God doesn't, you know, well, there's a dozen different things, and if you do it just right, and you're trying to remember, what were those 12 things? I can't even remember one. No, there's just one way. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am life. No one comes to the Father. Where is the Father? In heaven. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. No one comes to the Father except through me, by me. Jesus said, I'm the gate. Jesus said, I'm the door. But I don't want to go through that door. I want to go through my own door. Well, that's your choice, see? And I'm, that's why I'm saying anyone that ends up, wakes up, realizes that they're in hell, will not be able to blame God. Why? Because they're there of their own device. I tried to find the passage back. That's what the rich man. Well, if I can't get out of here, then send Lazarus to go tell my brothers. No, that ain't going to work either because if they didn't listen then, they're not going to listen now. If God would just show them a sign. We don't get saved by seeing signs. We get saved by faith. We're saved by grace through faith, that not of ourselves. You simply accept what Jesus Christ has done. You believe it in your heart. You confess it with your mouth. And the Bible says you will be saved. You say, Brother Jim, why do we know all this. We're saved because this is what people need to hear. They need to hear something beyond have a nice day. They, that's nice. They need to hear something beyond God bless you. I'll be praying for you. You know what? I don't, rarely do I ever tell anybody I'll be praying for you. I say, hey, man, will you pray for me? Yeah, like right now. Let's pray right now. I've had people I've witnessed to say, well, you know, be praying for me right here. Let's, let's do it now. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's not waste any time. Let's go for it right now. Amen. Let's pray right now. All right, I'm going to finish these lyrics and quit. Almost. You heard the almost. Relax. See, this is what the devil will tell people. Relax. Said the night man. Man, that's a devil, you know, the night man. He's the man of the darkness. Relax, said the night man. Oh, look, you're, look at these guys. I, here I am. You're all, you're, you just put them all ahead. You, there's no, nothing left. 
We're programmed to receive. You can check out anytime you like, but you can never leave. Wow, what a picture of hell. And that's really nice. But listen to this out of Ephesians chapter 2, 4 through 10. But God, listen to this. Who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, dead in our trespasses, in our sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised up together and made to set together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works. You can't work your way in, lest anyone should boast. We are, this is talking about you and I this morning, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. See, we're created for good works, we're not saved by them. We're not saved by good works, right? But we're created for good works which God prepared beforehand that uh, we should walk in them. I'm not even going to tell you where this verse is, guys, because now you can't put it up on the screen. I feel like I'm reading something for the first time. Keep on. It, It is in Philippians, so I'll tell you that much. Keep on imitating me, my brothers and sisters. Pay attention to those who follow the right example that we have set for you. So that's what we need to be doing, is setting the right example. I have told you this many times before, and I repeat it with tears. There are many who live whose lives make them enemies of Christ's death on the cross. I'll read that again. There are many whose lives... Make them enemies of Christ's death on the cross. They are going to end up in hell. You know, you start reading in the Bible and just searching hell and Hades and you you realize there's a lot in the Bible about hell and there's a lot in the Bible about God doesn't want you going there. The Bible says it's not his will that any perish but all come to everlasting life. You know, there's times when I've talked to people, I say, do you ever wonder what God's will is for your life? Have you ever thought about, you know, what God's plan? You know, most people just look at you like, why, you know, first of all, they have no clue that God has a plan for their life. So they're hearing something for the very first time. Well, no, not really. And it's as simple as, well, God's will and plan first and foremost First things first, it's at the top of the list. God's plan for your life is that you do not perish, but you have everlasting life. That one statement, folks, that one statement, you're paying for your groceries, you're pumping your gas, you're doing whatever, and there's that person there, and say, hey, can I ask you a question? I know you don't know me. Yeah, whatever, what, what, ask away. Do you ever wonder what? God has planned for you. Have you ever wondered that? I mean, 90 times, 99 times out of 100, people are, they're like, no, not really. If you could know what God's plan, would you want to know? Well, I suppose. The number one thing on God's plan for your life on his list is that you don't perish. Wow. Because their God, they're going to end up in hell. Why? Because their God is their bodily desires. In other words, you're just living for the moment. You're just living for what you want, what makes you happy, what pleases you, what seems right to you. They are proud of what they should be ashamed of. Boy, homosexuality, drunkenness, abuse, slander, I mean, you could just go on and on and on. And yet they're proud. Gay pride marches. They're proud of what they should be ashamed of. 
It doesn't matter what kind of sin. You think, well, you're picking on the, the LGBT or whatever. No, I mean, I, I could pick on probably a lot of Christians. I could pick on myself probably at times. That, However, I can't think of any sin that to this day that I may have sinned or committed a sin that I'm proud of. I'm not, anytime I've sinned as a Christian, I'm not proud of that. I was ugly to my wife. I said something mean to somebody. I was short-tempered or I don't know. There's numerous things that I could probably do that I'm not proud of. I'm not proud that back in April God had to jerk a little slack out of me because I'm letting all this garbage affect my attitude. I'm not proud of that. But I'm willing to reveal it. I'm willing to be honest and say, so what did you do? I, I repented. I, you know, the word repent doesn't mean fall on the ground, cry, weep, you know, roll around, oh God, I'm just a worm in the dirt. No, repent means change how you think. Quit thinking that way and think different. That's repentance. It's real simple. So I repented. I said, well, I'm not going to think like that anymore. So if I'm not going to think like that, then I'm not going to listen to the people that are pumping the information in my ears. I'm not going to read the stuff online that makes me upset. I'm just going to stick with the word. Well, then, brother, how are you going to know what's going on? I guarantee you there's enough people that will try to tell you what's going on. You don't need to go find the information for yourself. And I, most of the time I say, listen, I don't need my head filled with that trash because that's not going to help anybody. It's not going to change anything, but this is. Amen? They're proud of what they should be ashamed of, and they think only of things that belong to this world. We, you and me, however, are citizens of heaven, and we eagerly wait for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come from heaven. One of the reasons, one of the things that really caught my attention in 1979, Peggy and I got married we weren't living for God. I, I took her to church, but we weren't, we weren't living a godly life. We weren't seeking after God, but I still, you know, because of my upbringing stuff, we still went to church occasionally and that kind of stuff, but just not really living for God. And in 1979, we had an encounter with him. We made a decision to follow Jesus. But one of the things that helped lead up to that encounter that we had with the Lord in the middle of the night in our little 10 by 50 trailer house, had a water bed, man, king size. It was wall to wall. The bedroom was wall to wall water bed. You open the door and crawl in bed. That's all you did. It was awesome, you know, back in the days of water beds. Anyway, we had this encounter with God. But one of the things leading up to it was the, I started hearing messages about Jesus coming. I remember how Lindsay and the late great planet Earth, and there were all different, there were a lot of things, and you know, all you had to do is listen to Jimmy Swaggart. Or how about the guy out of New York, uh, uh, yeah, uh, David Wilkerson. Man, you listen to any of those guys, and all of a sudden you're like, I don't know if I'm going to make it. You know, if Jesus comes, I don't know if I'm going. <laughs> well, praise God, I know that today. So I just want to encourage you this morning. I know this might have been a little heavy. <laughs> but sometimes we just need to realize what's at stake. Thank God we're all saved. I don't maybe there's somebody here this morning you're not. You certainly shouldn't live, leave this place without seeing pastor over here, or you can come see me if you want, but, uh, or anybody sitting next to you to have them pray with you to ask Jesus in your heart. Don't leave here without doing that. But you and I need to live in a way this day that we're not just thinking about our eternal security and that we've got it made because we do have it made. I don't care what goes on in this world. I don't care what... The left does. I don't care what anybody does. The Word of God says, I'm blessed. 
The Word of God says that He's going to meet all my needs according to His riches and glory. The Word of God says not one hair on my head is going to be plucked out. You know, I, I mean, I, I have Psalms 91, no evil shall befall me, no plague, no COVID-19 shall come nigh my dwelling. That's what I live by. That's what I stand on. Somebody said I was in a meeting and nothing wrong with it, how excited they were that there's a, a vaccine. And praise God, I'm glad that there's, there is a, a vaccine for those that want. But I've been vaccinated by the Holy Ghost. I've been vaccinated, you can think I'm crazy, by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been vaccinated by the Word of God. See, I've been vaccinated by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And again, man, nothing, I'm not condemning nobody. I'm just telling that's that's to the extent I believe the Word of God. I believe there's an anointing in me and an anointing in you that when I stand in front of somebody, it's not me standing there, it's not me talking, but Christ in me. I believe that he gives me a mouth of wisdom, Pastor Mike, that none of my adversaries will be able to gainsay nor resist. I'll shut the devil down so fast Why? Speaking the word of God. What did Jesus do? Forty days he fasted and the devil come to him. Time after time to tempt him. What did Jesus say? The word says. Put the word on him. (laughs) Put the word on him. To the extent that the devil had to leave for a season. He had to go take a vacation. Man, I've been beat up enough. Some of you want to take a vacation from the devil. You need to put him on a vacation. Amen? Stand to your feet. Glory to God. Let me pray for you real quick. I've run the clock up pretty far, I'm sure. It's not noon, but or one o'clock. Hey, when you haven't been here for two years, come on. Hallelujah. I'll just say this. If there's anybody here this morning and You've never received Christ in your heart. I mean, you've never humbled yourself. You've never submitted yourself and said, Jesus, I believe in you. I've always really sort of believed in you, even since I was a kid, but I've never called on you. I've never asked you, Jesus, to come into my heart. I've never called you my Lord and Savior, so today I call you Lord and Savior. If you're here this morning, that's you. Just slip your hand up not going to ask you to come down here or do anything, but just perchance, if you're here this morning and you need to make Jesus Lord, I want you to lift your hand. Anybody? Okay, now I want to pray for all of us that are standing here this morning. I don't know about you, but my greatest desire is I do not want to leave this life. And I'm planning on living a long time. I don't have an expiration date that I'm looking towards. You know, if there is one, 120. 120. Why would anyone want Well, I don't know if I want to live that long or not, but I, I'm going to put it out there anyway and then see where, where things are at. Amen. But I'm not going to die because the devil took me out. I'm not going to die because some disease took me out. The steps of the righteous are order of the Lord. I'm walking with Jesus. Life and death are in the power of my tongue. But right now, I pray over each and every one of us that our greatest desire, Lord, would be your will be done. Lord, that we would be your witnesses. Lord, that you would use us, work through us, manifest your Self, your word, your power through us, Lord. Let us be your hands, your feet. That's what the word says, that we're his hands and feet. Lord, use us and help us. Holy Ghost, you're the helper. We call on you. Help us, Holy Spirit, to live a life that examples the will of God and to be bold enough to speak the word and to speak truth to people. Not just to turn our eyes or to turn our attention away from those that are in darkness and figure, well, 
guess that's just the way it is, but Lord will intercept them and give them an opportunity to choose whether they want to continue to live in darkness or if they want to come into the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Help us, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Pastor Rich, thank you so much. Appreciate, your, appreciate the ministry this morning. Praise God. You know, I just was thinking about how all, all the stuff that uh, has happened in not just this past year, but past years, it's just sort of been ramping up and peaking up. And how God is such a God of redemption. And uh, what He's uh, bringing is an awakening. And I thank you that, you know, what the Lord put in your heart is a, an awakening of our hearts to his heart for us and for others. Amen. And, uh, you know, I, I believe we're on a, we're on the, the cusp of a greater awakening and a great, uh, really beyond what awakenings have been. And so that's exciting. That's easy to say. <laughs> but so many times it comes through being slapped around a little bit, right? It comes through facing ourselves comes through hearing about the, mm, the reality of, of uh, eternity without Jesus, a hell that's real, it's hot, and those kind of things God can use to awaken us, and that's why he's given gifts to the body of Christ, not only to equip us, but to awaken us and to march us forward in the, with the life that we have to offer, amen. I, that's just where I see us today. Amen. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Amen? Amen. So, Father, I just pray you're covering your blessing upon your people. As we go from this place, we go in the fullness of the spirit. We go with our eyes having been enlightened. Our eyes open, our hearts open, our hearts healed. Lord, when we would easily just close up, thank you, Father, for a, a release of your grace that keeps us open-hearted receiving from you and willing to give. Thank you, Father, for this church, for your church in this city, in our nation, for such a time as this. Lord, on the face of this earth, Lord, with the, the seeming advance of an evil agenda, Lord, even a greater advance of the influence of your kingdom, and so we pray together, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Whew, good stuff. Good stuff. What a, what a wonderful time together this morning. For those who weren't able to make it, uh, you're with us online. We miss you guys. Bless you. Uh, I bet the snow's all melted off by the time we get outside. <laughs> oh, well. Awesome. God bless you guys. Share some fellowship before you leave. And uh, have a great week.